All right. Well, we've been, we've been, and we're going to continue to look at some examples of revival from the Old Testament. Um, last week, or the week before, actually, we looked at the revival under Jacob. We said the big issue there was the destruction of the idols. Um, we ask you to consider what in your life is there that you allow to take the place of God? Let me just make sure we're still on here. There we go. There we go, Ken. Are we on? Let's see if we can get this thing to work tonight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Tonight we're going to think of the matter of confession of sin. And, and as we go through this, you're going to see those elements of. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 brought out if we humble ourselves and pray, seek the face of God, repent of our wicked ways. Tonight we're going to look at confession. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess in the in the Greek language simply means to agree with. Um, we talk about our, our confession of faith, uh, the Baptist faith and message. These are the things that we agree upon as Southern Baptists. A confession of faith is a list of the things that we agree upon, the doctrines that we all subscribe to. When we talk about confession of sin, we're talking about coming into agreement with God. Um, Another word that kind of goes along with that is the word reconcile. We are at enmity with God. We come back and we reconcile with him. Uh, when you reconcile your checkbook, you, you look at it and you see what your record says and what the bank's record says, right, Julie? And what you do when you see there's a difference, you go back and you look for where the, the problem is. I can usually guarantee it's not with the bank. On rare occasions, they make a mistake, but most of the time, they get it right. The mistake is usually on the part of the person who writes the checks, pays the bills, writes them in the checkbook. Sometimes it's poor math. Uh, poor math. Sometimes, most of the time, it's just poor handwriting mm -hmm. that we can't read our own writing. So that's why the reconciler comes along and uh, checks it all out and makes sure it's all right. And uh, and in our family, it's, uh, and yeah, sometimes it's poor math, but there's a reason for that, because most of the time I just do the math in my head, because I can usually do that pretty accurately. Um, usually? Usually. <laughs> Ask Patty, she'll Next tell you. Next the reconciler. <laughs> he writes like a doctor? Laverne <laughs> Reed, our treasurer in McHenry, used to be, She'd say, well, here's what we got. And I'd say, I'd tell her the answer. And she'd say, wait a minute. She'd get the calculator out and just, wait a minute. And I'd go, oh, he's right again, you know. And I don't know why that is. I can just kind of see things in my head and usually do that. But anyway, I can see it in my head, but when I write it down, I can't read it. And so that's why Julie has to come along. Yeah. <laughs> Bottom line is that our sin, and we saw this this morning, sin separates us from God. Um, it robs us of the benefits, the joy of our salvation. Dr. Bill Bright was the founder of, of uh, and director of Campus Crusade for many years. He was, he was a wonderful person. I got to hear him speak on a number of occasions. And one time he was telling a story about how he had bought a train set for his kids at Christmas time and set it up under the Christmas tree and it was all set to go. And uh, they plugged it in, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And he said, here we were. We had all the power of Southern California Power and Light, or whatever the company was called, coming through. And, and, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't run. It wouldn't run. Something was wrong. And he said, we looked around, we looked around, and we finally saw on the back there was a little cross buck, you know, railroad crossing sign that was came with the train set and it had fallen over and it was laying across the rails of the train and it was short-circuiting short circuiting 
the power. And they picked it up and stood it up, and immediately the train started to run. That's what happens. Sin short circuits the power of God in our life. The power of God is there. The God, power of God is present. It's not like God's sovereignty is diminished in any way by our sin or our, our unworthiness. But what we do puts a barrier between us and God and cuts us off from his power. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. We're admonished in 2 Chronicles to seek the face of God. Why do we need to do that? Because God has hidden his face from us because of our sin. And this leads us to two tragic realities. One, of course, is the separation from God. And then the other is the fact that such separation makes us useless to him. And so we need to go back and find out where the blockage is that has rendered us impotent. John 15, verse 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. Zero. And that's illustrated for us, I think, in this incident in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 32, 33, and 34. You remember, in chapter 32, Moses went up, well, actually before that, Moses went up onto the mountain to receive the tablets of the law. And in chapter 32, the people saw that Moses delayed coming down. He stayed up there longer than expected. And they gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool. Listen to all this. He received it, he fashioned it with an engraving tool. He made a molded calf, and then said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. What an affront to God that was. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation. I want you to notice the wording here. Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Notice that in your Bible. It's in all capital letters. We found out this week that that means that that is the covenant name of God. This is a feast to Jehovah, Yahweh. Verse 6. Then they rose up early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Moses was on the mountain longer than they expected him to be. And so they began to take matters into their own hands. First thing we see in verse 1 is they replaced God with gods who would go before them. This is the sin of idolatry. It's a sin of ingratitude and thanklessness treacherous sin. Uh, I'm trying to read my writing again. The, the people were not content with the God that had led them out of Egypt. They wanted to make a God in their own image. And as I said sometime along this week, God created man in his image and then man returned the favor. And so in verse 2, Aaron, the priest, the leader, went along with them. Hosea 4, 9 says, like people, like priests. And you'll notice in verses 4 through 6, all of the activity that went on. And, and in verse 6, he says, let's make a feast to the Lord, the Lord, Jehovah. This is the sin 
of what we call syncretism. That is to say, we're going to take the worship of God, God Almighty, the true God, and worship Him in our own ways, in our in our own method, with our own you know ideas and our own pictures of what we think He should be. It's the sin of syncretism. I would say it is one of the prominent sins of our day. The Bible tells us we can't serve two masters. We cannot worship God and mammon. But we seek to worship God on our own terms. You hear people say things like, well, God understands. That's just what I do. You know, I, uh, I won't do it his way. I'll do it my way. But it's okay. Jesus is just all right with me. Right? So now it's party time. Sin begets more sin. The Bible says they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. The language here, to, the word to play, uh, has a connotation of sexual prostitution. It's a word that's used in uh, Genesis 26 and verse 8 in the uh, uh, English Standard Version. It says, uh, Isaac was laughing with Rebekah. Uh, the New King James Version says he was showing endearment for her. The New American Standard Version is probably the most graphically accurate. It says Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebecca. The word simply means fondling her. That's the word. They, they sat down to eat and they rose up to play sexually. And so God's response, at the very least, he said he was going to withdraw his presence from the nation and refuse to be with them any longer. In chapter 33 and verse 3, he says, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, and I will not go up with in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. He's saying, Go on, go up, go into the land yourself, but I'm not going with you. If I go with you, I'm liable to just consume you. I'm so fed up with you people. And then we see a great demonstration of God's grace to forgive and cleanse the nation. We have the invitation of Isaiah 44 and verse 22 where he says, Return to me, for I have redeemed you. I have blotted out your sins as a cloud. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. He says in Jeremiah 3 and verse 1, Return to me. Verse, chapter 4 and verse 1. If you return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me, and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. Again, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn, repent from their wicked ways, return to God. You see, sin, sin and, and remember this, sin comes with its own built-in penalty. Right? You know that to be true. And it doesn't always have to be so obvious and apparent as you know, the drunkard who gets in trouble or develops a liver disease or the sexually promiscuous who develops a venereal disease or anything just that plain and open. But sin carries its own penalty. The destruction of relationships, earthly relationships, the removal of the presence of God. And so God says, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and return, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. <clears throat> First John 1 John 1.9, if, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I want us to think tonight of the risk that we face when we fail to confess our sins and return to God. All right? So that's where we're going to be. In chapter 32, verses 7 through 14. Number one, we face God's wrath and anger for our sins. Chapter 32 and verse 7 says, The Lord said to Moses, get, Go get down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Notice, your people. Your people. I remember many, many times coming home and saying, how was, the day? How was your day? And Julie says to me, your daughter has been impossible. Not my daughter, but your daughter. 
You know what your daughter did today? You know what your grandson did? Bethany called the other day. You know what your grandson did? <laughs> what? Why, why is it always my kid when they're doing something wrong? You know? But God says to Moses, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And they've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. And said, this is your God, O Israel. And put down, brought you out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> Can you imagine Moses hearing this? The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Moses said, yeah, I, I, I noticed. Uh, Therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. No sense of trying to hide our sin. God sees and knows everything. Someone said we ought to care much less about what people think of us than what God knows of us. Think about David who attempted to hide and cover up his sin with Bathsheba. And God sent the prophet Nathan as if to say, I know all about what you've done here. I know all about it. And I'm going to tell you this story. Remember the story about the man with the sheep and he went and stole the little lamb of the guy that had, and as if to say, I want you to see this from my perspective. God says, you need to see this. That's the first step in getting us to confess and agree, is to get, our, get us to see our sin the way God does. Think about Achan, who took the accursed thing and how the process was laid out to search for the accursed item, narrowing it down from tribe to clan to family to household, tightening the circle until... They found the stolen items in Achan's tent. Verses 7 and 8, God quotes verbatim what the Israelites had said. Look at that. Nothing was hidden. It's not what we can get away with, but what God sees and knows about us. And so God's indignation here is obvious in verse 7. Again, he says, your people, verse 9, verse 10, your people. His counteroffer was to make a great nation of Moses. He says, leave me alone. Get these people out of here. I don't want to be with them anymore. I'll take you and make you a great nation. Well, you and I, we'll start over. And then Moses begins to intercede in verse 11. Moses pleaded with the Lord. And said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and all this land which I have spoken of I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented. Look at his only hope. The only hope that he had was the covenant that God had made. That's why he reminds him of Abraham and Isaac. The promises you made to our fathers. Our only hope is the covenant that God made with Jesus Christ, his own son. We like to think that God made a covenant with us. No, the covenant that God made was with his son. If you go and die on, for these people, I will save them. And so our hope, our plea, is that Jesus Christ died in our place. I have no other confidence. I have no other plea. It was enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And so the, he says, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? He reminds them that they are his people that you brought out of Egypt. Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them, to leave them, to let them die in the wilderness? He says, what will the heathen say? And so he says, will you not turn from your fierce wrath and relent from the harm that you purpose on your people? The thing is, down Below, in the valley, the people were casting off all restraint. Why? Because they hadn't heard from Moses for a while. Moses was up on the mountain. And here's a perfect illustration of what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 29, 18. 
where there's no vision, that is to say where there's no revelation from God, the people perish or literally cast off restraint. They go their own way. We see it in the book of Judges. There was no king in those days and the people did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. They went their own way. How many times when we were going through the book of Jeremiah last year did I say that the most severe punishment that God gives us is when he lets us go our own way. He lets us have our own way. You want to do it your way? Can you imagine? I, I used to... My daughter, Stephanie. Whenever we had a big blow up at home, she always said the same thing over. Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And I asked her one time, do you realize what a mess you would be in if I would just leave you alone? Who's going to pay your bills? Who's going to buy you food? Who's going to give you a place to sleep? What, is that what you want? You want me to just leave you alone? See, we all think we want our parents to just get off our back and leave us alone, right? And we get out and live away from them for a while, and we realize, boy, mom and dad sure did an awful lot for me, except I didn't realize kind of the picture here. Number two, I, I want to say this, and I don't want you to be confused by what I'm going to say, all right? We face the loss of the atonement for our sins. Now, I'm not saying that we lose our salvation, okay? I hope you know I'm not saying that. What I want you to look at here is look at these people and see what they were doing. What did the atonement provide for us? A relationship with God. Uh, access to his presence. And what happens when we sin and we treat the atonement as if it meant nothing to us? It's the same thing as when we read in, in Hebrews about counting the blood of the covenant as a common thing. Or in Hebrews 10 and verse 26 where it says, if we continue to willfully sin, there remains no more sacrifice. It's like we're saying, that didn't mean anything to me. Look, Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, to take sin out of the way, to, to tear that veil so that we would have access to God. And then we go our own way and sin and go out and we say, God, I don't need you. I'm going to do this my way. What's the point of what Jesus did? We treat it as if it's a meaningless thing, a common thing. So, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that we nullify the atonement or, or it, it becomes of none effect, we lose our salvation, none of that. But we risk, we run the risk that the atonement would be of no value to us with regard to our particular sin. We say, Lord, I'd rather do this sin than be in your company and be in your presence. Think of that. We're choosing sin over the relationship we have with God. Have you ever done that? I have. I have. There have been times in my life when I said, God, I'll be back later. But right now, I'm just going to do it my way. Chapter 32 and verse 26 Moses threw down the, uh, the tablets. In verse 26 it says, He stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come with me. And all the people of Israel mocked, gathered themselves together to him. That's, uh, I can't the verse I wanted. I just can't find it. 34, 26. No. I'm sorry, I wrote down the wrong words. There we go, verse 16. Now the tablets were the work of God and the writing of the tablets of God were engraved on the stone. Uh, verse 15, Moses turned and went down to the mountain and the two tablets of testimony. The tablets were written on both sides, one side and the other, and they were written. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, they shouted, there's a noise in the camp. Oh, where am I? Anyway, Moses threw, threw the tablets down destroyed them, symbolizing the breaking of the law. And then in verse 30, he tells them about the enormity of their sin. Look at, he says, 
You've committed a great sin. Do you realize that? How great our sin is? You've committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses says, I will try to atone. I will try to bring you back into a relationship with God. Perhaps I can make an atonement. He's not doubting that there was an atonement, but whether he could be the instrument. Amos 5 and verse 15, it says, It may be that the Lord will be gracious. Or Jonah 1, 6, It may be that the Lord will think of us. Or in Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, I just read it this morning, If perhaps these... Uh, uh, Philip is talking to Simon the magician, he says, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. And so he goes up and he begins to plead with God in verse 32. Look, um, verse 31. Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a, a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but look what he says. But if not, I pray blot me out of your book, which you have written. You see Moses' heart here? Moses is standing in the place of the intercessor saying, Lord, will you forgive the sins of your people? And I love the way it's recorded here. I, I believe that God recorded it just as he said it. Even stopping mid-sentence, Lord, forgive the sins of your people, but, but if you won't, well then, Lord, take me out of the book of life. Blot me out. He was seemingly offering himself as an offering for their sins. Now, just like Paul's wish in Romans 9 and verse 3, Paul said, I wish I, that I myself were accursed for Christ, from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Offering himself a ransom for the people. The exchange of his own life for the release of the guilt of their sin. Obviously, Ezekiel 14 tells us that in uh, verse 14 and verse 20, no one, no human life can atone for anyone else's guilt. He speaks of Noah and Daniel and Job in that passage. Only Christ. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12 says. And so in verse 33, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of his father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But how risky it is to wait for the judgment of God. He says, now therefore go and lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day that I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sins. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf that Aaron made. And you remember he had people grind it up and pour it in the water and drink the, I mean, when you, you don't, maybe don't realize that heavy metals like gold are, are very, very poisonous, very poisonous. We think about mercury poisoning and things like that. I know they use silver in medicine, certain kinds of medicine. We use gold in arthritis medicine. Yeah, but I mean, too much of it. Uh, it's like any drug. A little bit can can do great things, but a, a lot can kill you. <sighs> How risky it is to wait for God's judgment with an unrepentant heart. We need his atonement. We are dependent on his atoning work on the cross. That's our only hope. Again, Isaiah 44, 22, he says, I've blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Let me give you these last two quickly. Number three, we face the loss of the presence of God. Chapter 33 deals with that. Verses 1 through 5, they're told to go and enter the promised land, but he says, I'm not going to go with you. Israel had not yet shown any particular signs of repentance. And so, again, sin cuts us off from God. God says, you go ahead and go in. I'm not going with you, though. Why is it that we don't call on God for forgiveness? Well, that's hard to do when you're in 
when you're sinning and when you're stuck in sin, right? You ever wonder why it took Jonah three days to pray for God to get him out of the belly of the whale? <laughs> I'd like to think that if it were me, I'd be saying, oh God, get me out of this before I was even, you know, halfway in his, you know, I think of the Jaws, you know, where Peter Benchley, I think it was, was halfway into the shark and he's crying out. You know, why wasn't Jonah crying out to God the minute he saw the whale coming for him? I'll tell you why. Because he was running away from God. It's hard to pray to God when you're running from him. That's why God says what? Return to me. Turn around and come home. Sin cuts us off from God. That's why we don't call on him. We're too proud to bend the knee and to bend our knees. We need to humble ourselves. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Now look at verse 6, chapter 33. The children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Verse 7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. He says, you got to come out. Verse 9. It came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Moses set up the camp, out his tent outside of the camp. Now think about this. Where did Jesus die? Outside of Jerusalem. Outside of the camp. And if we're going to go to God, we've got to go outside of the, you know, outside of the realm of the comfort zone, and go out and meet him where he is. Verse 12, on down through verse 16, especially verse 15, he says, if your presence does not go with us, don't bring us up from here. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight? What is it that separates us? What makes a difference between us and the world if it's not the presence of God? And if the presence of God isn't here, then what are we? Why are we here? If God's not here, what's the point of us coming here? I mean, I'll tell you this. If, if, if the presence of God is not here, you ought to find a church where he is. See, I believe he comes and meets us. I don't know about you. I believe he's here. I believe there's a lot of churches in town that... I'm not saying we're any better than them. or I, I, I don't, don't mistake what I'm saying here. But, I mean, if you go to a bunch of churches and you don't find the work of God there, you don't find the Spirit of God moving there, you don't feel the presence of God, it's worth driving past that church to go to one where he is. Um, it was interesting to me, we had a, a period of growth in a church where I used to serve and, and uh, kind of a growth spurt. We had a lot of new people coming in. And... Uh, we had one family that came and joined, and I mean, they joined quickly. They came a couple weeks, and they wanted to join right away, and they said, boy, the presence of God is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And about two weeks after that, I preached a message on Romans chapter 14 about the liberty that we have in Christ, and they got all mad and all offended because I didn't get up and say that it was a sin to drink, and I said that, you know, that's an issue that where different people have different points of views, and God says, who are you to judge another man's servant? I, list, I listed off a bunch of what I call gray areas, you know, things where, you know, we do think, and I, the, the whole point of the sermon was the things that we do, so many of the things that we do or don't do, we do out of love for one another, not because there's a law against it, right? And I, I said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That was the text. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Oh, they got so mad, they left... After being members for two weeks, they left the church. I said, well, what's the issue? My daddy never kissed me goodnight with alcohol on his breath. And I said, well, that's wonderful. But what the Bible says, it says. And what it doesn't say, it doesn't say. What do you want me to say? Do you want me to preach the Bible? Or do you want me to preach about your daddy kissing you goodnight every night? You know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is... God's at work. We don't, we're not going to argue about, you know, what style of music we listen to or what kind of, you know, how you need to dress when you come to church. Those, those are issues that are between you and God, and the Holy Spirit is perfectly able to convict 
able to convict you, and you don't need somebody to give you a list of rules to follow. If you love the Lord, you'll respond to him out of the love of your heart for him. Right? Right? Everybody, right? I'm here. Okay. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying, hey, let's party or something. That's not the point. The point is, we answer to God. You answer to God. I was visiting a, a family one night, and they were having their dinner, and they had a little something to drink on the table. And I looked at it, and they said, you want a pop? I said, sure, I'll have a pop, you know. I don't know if they thought I was going to get upset about something. I, I, I just, not my place to play deputy Holy Spirit with you, all right? Uh, we had a pastor who used to say, before you start getting up in somebody's face, you better make sure you're wearing your Deputy Holy Spirit badge, right? If you don't have your Deputy Holy Spirit badge on, stay out of the way and let the Spirit work, right? Should be part of the party. Yeah. <laughs> but again, sin cuts us off from God. It takes, the pre takes us out of the presence of God, and that's a serious issue, right? Look. Jesus died so that we could have access to him, so that we could have a relationship with him. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Want to know why we're ineffective? The first place to look, I think, is, is there some sin in my life that I haven't dealt with? We treat the Lord like we'd rather be with the presence of the world than with him. Then, yeah, we're going to be cut off. From the power. <coughs> we treat the things of this world, the golden calves that we make, and we say, this is our God. What an affront it is to our God who gave himself and shed his own blood to purchase us so that we can have access to him. That's why he says, I've redeemed you. Return to me. He says in Isaiah, what more could I do for these people? Repent and return to me. Number four, we face the loss of the goodness of God. Chapter 33, down through 34, Moses asks to see God's glory. Now again, the glory of God is the, the weight of his presence, the thereness, the manifestation of who he is. And we pray for the presence of God to come. And listen, I know the Bible says wherever two or three are gathered in his name, he's here in our midst. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the manifest presence of God. When God is here and you know it, you know what I'm talking about? I, I tell people when I was at Southern Seminary in 1999 and 2000, and this was like three years, four years after Dr. Muller had come and the church, and they were, I mean, cleaning house. They were bringing in all new professors and there was a real move of the spirit going on there. And there were many, many times, I, I, I'm telling you, when we were in class, and one by one, guys would just start getting down on their knees. And the professor would look out, Dr. Wallace usually, would look out and say, gentlemen, let's just take some time and go to the Lord. And, and you, you walk it through the halls, it was like, I don't mean to be irreverent, but it was almost spooky. God was there. God was moving. And I don't know how to describe it. If you've never experienced that, it's kind of hard for me to put into words and articulate what it, but when, you, when it's going on, you know it. I've been in some prayer meetings where, I mean, literally, I was almost literally afraid to open my eyes because, you know, the Lord was moving. That's what we're talking about. The manifest presence of God. So the goodness of God. Moses said, I want to see your face. God says, no, you can't see my face and live. I'm going to show you my backside. Now, this is obviously an anthropomorphic statement that is describing God in human terms. Not sure what to tell you it means exactly. But it says in verse 6 of chapter 34, The Lord passed before and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. This is what God was revealing about himself in that moment. 
as he forgave the sins of the people and called them back to himself. God's grace, God's mercy. When God revealed himself to Moses in chapter 6 of Hebrews, he said, he revealed his covenant name, Yahweh, I am that I am. That expresses his character and his identity. And this is what God is revealing to Moses again here. I am. I don't change. I don't waver. There's no uh, shadow of turning. I change not. My compassions fail not. And so I want to just quickly wrap up by showing you five particular attributes of God here that we see in this. Number one, his mercy and compassion. It's interesting in the text here, these two words are related to the word womb. I think it's comparing God's love for us to that of the love of a mother for her baby. And this is the starting place of our relationship, God's grace and mercy. For by grace are we saved through faith. Number two is his graciousness. His unmerited, undeserved favor. If it was based on what we deserved, we wouldn't have anything. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7. We won't take the time to look at it, but it talks about how God is rich in mercy. 1 Peter 1, and verse 3 says, According to his abundant mercy, he's begotten us again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So number one, God's mercy or compassion. It's the same word in that's used in the text here. Might be translated in either way in your Bible. Number two, his grace. Number three, his long suffering. His long suffering. It's interesting that the word that's used here to describe the long suffering of God in verse six. He says, God is merciful and gracious, long suffering. The word long suffering literally means long in the nostrils. It's kind of weird. But what's the opposite? Having the nostrils flared, you know, angry, snarling. No, God's not like that. And then it says he's full of grace and truth. Interestingly, when Jesus came, John 1 and 17, it says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That's important that we get both sides of that coin. God's grace, his undeserved favor, but also his truth, doesn't nullify the fact that we have, in fact, violated his law. It's just that he's not going to repay us what we deserve. He's going to give us instead his grace, his mercy, his favor. Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. I think we have the answer here. Why does revival tarry? I think in a word, because we don't get serious about confessing our sin to God, dealing with our sin, calling them out, acknowledging to God, I have sinned and I need you, I need your mercy. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes his sins will have mercy. And God says, My presence is going to pass by you today that we might know him and his gracious attributes and trust in him. But how often we let our sin separate us from him and keep us from enjoying the benefits of the relationship we have with him. I want to encourage you to take a look this week at Psalm 51. And real quickly before we close, look up at the screen and see Psalm 32. David says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. You ever feel that way? That's a mark of depression. A description of depression, I guess I should say. I don't know how much you read about different 
Christian counselors and that style. Jay, I'm a fan of Jay Adams, who's with the Lord now, but he introduced a school of what's called new pathetic counseling, uh, dealing with sin as the source of a lot of depression. I can tell you that I've been through that. But look at verse 5. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Wow. What a blessing that is. To know. He, he begins by saying, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. In verse 1. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. You know what that feels like? To, to just feel clean. I can tell you there have been times in my life when I just had to get things off my chest. I had to call people and confess and get right with them. And boy, it just felt like I got saved all over again. You know? And the power of God was apparent. And people said, Man, I never heard you preach like that. And it's just God was at work. What's blocking up the flow of God's move, mercy and grace and power in our lives? It's not worth it. He says, return to me. I've already atoned for your sin. I've already redeemed you. Return to me. I've blotted your sin out like a cloud. So come back and experience the joy of your salvation all over again. Father, Teach us tonight what it means to confess our sins and to get right with you, be right with you. Have your will and way now as we have this time of response. Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts and accomplish your perfect will for your glory.